Hello, and welcome back to the How to Get an Analytics Job podcast. Our guest this week is Alex Freyberg, also known as Alex the Analyst. He is a YouTuber and an analyst who has blown up recently in popularity. In this podcast episode, we have both Al Bellamy, my social media manager, and Hunter Brown, who is my intern. And in this episode, Alex breaks down Hunter's LinkedIn page and also some of his Tableau Public Portfolio pieces. Then we talk about online courses and what makes an online course good or bad from Alex's perspective. So we have two new things going on within the podcast. Number one, we have a new Discord server. So check the link in the description and you can join in on our community. And we've also launched the Silvertone Analytics Learning Academy. Here you can learn step-by-step -step how to build your own case studies. It focuses on the business use case, the technical skills, and then also how to communicate those case studies in an interview setting. Also, don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell if you want future notifications about upcoming podcast episodes. If you're getting a lot of value out of the podcast, the best thing that you can do to give back to us is leave a like, a comment in the comment section down below, or even share this on social media. With all that being said, let's jump into the podcast episode. Alex Freiberg, it's been so long. How have you been? I am doing exceptionally well. Thanks for having me on. I've been looking forward to this for a couple of weeks now. Well, I mean, we just haven't like had a face to face. I feel like we have like little snippet conversations of like, hey, I saw you're doing this. This is pretty cool or vice versa. But I want to sit down with you and like have a long form like conversation about, well, first of all, what have you been up to? So I see your YouTube channel is blowing up. <laughs> Which let's actually share that. Um, oh, the internet's lagging a little bit. All right, so Alex the analyst, you guys have just hit seventy thousand. Yeah, congratulations, yeah. that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I I mean, I've been looking forward to it. It's it feels like it's going really fast, which is great. Um, and you know. There's just so many people who are coming into this field right now. And uh, I, I, you know, as the channel grows, I notice like there's just a lot of people who are trying to enter the field, right? And you know, that's what my channel is all about. It's helping new people get into the field, create projects, create a resume, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, it's just kind of wild to see that there are so many people because, you know, even a year ago, I couldn't have told you that there were 70,000 people who wanted to be data analysts. I mean, it just, I know there's more out there, but that, that are like actively looking. So it's really interesting. And, um, and so, yeah, it's been really fun uh, to create these videos and engage with the community and, and grow the channel. Okay. So this is making me think of, do you think there's a supply? What's going on with the supply and demand? Do you think that there is an over influx of people trying to get these jobs or do you think it's growing at a rate that we're not even keeping up with? It's something that I've wrestled with. I've kind of gone back and forth with. I think as of today, um, I'm more on the side of there's a little, it's, it, it's a little bit oversaturated. And my main reason for that is there are so many jobs available, but there's also so many people coming into this field and people have seen like when there was at the beginning of that pandemic, the people who had the most stable options were people who could work remotely. So mm -hmm. people are trying to get those remote jobs. Um, a lot of people are wanting to go into tech, who are wanting to be data engineers, software developers, um, web designers, data analysts, data scientists. And one something that has a, a fairly low or lower than some of those other really technical positions, a low barrier to entry is a data analyst. And so I've seen a large influx of people who want to be data analysts for that exact reason. It's somewhat low barrier of entry, plus you can learn all the skills by yourself. And also, you know, it's, it's not future proof um, in terms of like, you know, if another pandemic hits or something like that, but it's definitely a lot safer than, than mm -hmm. some of these other jobs. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that there are just, there's just like so many people trying to apply and get into this space right now. So I agree that there is some saturation going on but I also feel like something else is going on as well. So, right, there's a tang there's a finite amount of jobs that have analysts or business intelligence in the title. Mm -hmm. But 
I also think that if you have an area of expertise, let's say you're a sales specialist or a marketing specialist or a supply chain specialist, if you can sprinkle in these analytic skills, then all of a sudden there are a lot of kind of hybrid roles that are opening up and there's almost no way to like quantify how big that is. Right. Yeah, no, you're right. There's, there's lots of like uh, digital marketing analysts, um, healthcare analysts, financial analysts, like, you know, those, domain specific ones that you see a, a, a lot that are growing a lot. Um, you know, I'm in healthcare, so I notice healthcare the most and I'm like, man, there's a lot of healthcare analyst jobs that I'm seeing come up. Um, and that's just my, my bias because I'm in that field, but yeah, you're absolutely right. And, you know, I think that, you know, I just did a video recently on if you don't have any experience, how do you get into the field? And that's genuinely, I mean, what you're saying is what's happening is people are taking their previous experience in accounting or previous experience in, um, you know, construction or whatever it is or healthcare. And they're like, well, I have this, this skill. If I just add, you know, add some analytical um, abilities to that, I can use my domain knowledge and get a job in analytics. Uh, and so, yeah, I think you are right. Um, it's really hard to say definitively, like what's going on um, at any moment, but I mean, the field is growing, the, the the space is growing. I just think there may be, it may be out being outpaced by how many people are trying to get in. Right. Yeah. I could see there kind of being like a shorter term bubble, but mm -hmm. uh, what you're, what you're talking about of like com combining uh, some, some business acumen with, you know, maybe SQL or Excel or Tableau, that's a skill stack, which um, I don't know. It, it, are you a fan of Scott Adams? I don't know who that is. <laughs> so Scott Adams. Uh, he's the creator of Dilbert. You've heard of Dilbert, right? Yes. So, um, <laughs> so I've read one of his books, which is called um, How to almost Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big. And he talks about like that idea of, of stacking because it's one strategy is to be the world's best data scientist. Mm -hmm. But that's like a huge amount of focus on just doing one singular thing versus if you know some accounting and some data visualization, all of a sudden you've whittled down your competition because very few mm -hmm. people know both of those at the same time. Right. Yeah. No, I, I think it's so, a, a, definitely a good thought. <laughs> okay. Well, um, one thing that you also mentioned in one of your recent videos is how to catch the eye of recruiters. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've got Hunter who is one of my former students at high point university, who's now my intern. So let's head over oh, to awesome. LinkedIn and yeah, well actually, Alex, have you met both Al, who's our social media manager, and Hunter? I feel like I'm being such a rude host. <laughs> have you guys officially met yet? No, I haven't met Hunter, but I've talked to Al like a ton. And this is the first time I'm actually like seeing him. <laughs> but I but I've seen him in videos and like I've talked to him several times and and you know he comments on my channel and I'll I'll, I'll chat back. And so I feel like I know him already. Uh, but no, I haven't actually like met him through here. Yeah, I think this is this is the first time with both you and Hunter that uh, we've conversed anywhere other than, uh, yeah, chats or uh, message boards or something like that. So yeah, exactly. Good, good to find them each, Alex. Same. Same well, yeah, here. I guess, <laughs> Same. I guess you guys talk to each other regularly just through a text, but like, I don't know. It it's interesting because like talk connecting with someone versus text is less intense than talking to someone over video, which is less intense than like meeting them in person. We live in <laughs> such a weird digital world now. <laughs> Speaking of weird digital wor worlds, let's head over to LinkedIn. I totally got lost on a tangent. So um, I want you to critique Hunter's profile. Because one thing that we talked about last yeah. semester at High Point is personal branding. Mm -hmm. And I noticed in the video that you posted that if you have a good enough personal brand, in the analytics space, you're going to have recruiters proactively reaching out to you. In a sense, yeah. So <laughs> what are your thoughts? Hit me with so, hits, so some, crit some criticism. Lot, yeah, I do have a lot of thoughts on LinkedIn as a job platform, right? I love LinkedIn. I think it's one of the best places to get a job. Your profile does absolutely help. Um, and so before we like actually start looking at it like super quick, I think that optimizing your LinkedIn profile will absolutely help with getting recruiters, talking with recruiters, getting a job. I 100% agree. Um, but there are other ways that even further your 
uh, possibilities of getting a job. But this is definitely one of the main avenues that I recommend. Um, and so uh, Hunter, you know, whatever I say, I haven't looked at it yet. Whatever happens, uh, I I care about you, and this is not personal. I promise. Oh wait, so <laughs> yeah, okay, Hunter, can I, I, I'll let can you I preface this a little bit? <laughs> so in prior episodes, um, we actually met with Danny Lauer, who's a supply chain analyst at Amazon, and so he ha had the opportunity to tear apart one of my Tableau uh, dashboards, and so okay. I'm no stranger to. Uh, any kind of critique. In fact, I That's welcome fantastic. it because it it helps me grow as a person. So don't feel bad for anything you say. If you want, if you want to say something, just say it, and I'll take it with earnest. Okay. I love that. Perfect. He's he's also been through one of my rigorous classes, and I am a very very stern and intense professor. Yeah, he had a ruler and <laughs> oh, never mind, never mind. <laughs> no, no, no capital punishment. But um, no, I mean we we did kind of. Uh, banter back and forth because part of part of what we did in the class was to have them build out a portfolio and i think uh kind of on a more serious note i did want them to get used to the idea of putting their work out there and then having some distance between the work that they've done and then who they are as a person like right. just because you know you look silly in your linkedin profile here right. doesn't mean you're a bad person Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> i hear i hear you on that yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I'm I'm game. Let's let's do it. All right. All right. So, okay. So, first thing off the bat, nice headshot. Uh, I I recommend people getting at least a semi-professional one or something that looks better than like you just like in the in your backyard. Um, it, today's phones are pretty easy to get that. So most people should have that. I think that's a really good photo. Um, you have the open to work on. Um, that's great i know that's a that's a new linkedin thing that's been going on for the past like year um i like your background i think that it's you've obviously put some effort into it it's customized to data analysis which is great um looks good uh so you have hunter brown underneath it is that like it's not that's not your summary or your bio right no that's just the uh that's like the header it's like a it's right. like almost a summary of the summary if you right, think of right. it like that I, I totally get that. To me, it's like super long. Um, you know, I personally think a shorter one is better, in my opinion. I don't know about you guys, but when I see those like super long ones and they're like 30,000 followers, uh, LinkedIn professional, like all these things, I'm like, look, just what do you do? What are you looking for? What are you trying to get? Something, something short. I prefer that. Like on mine, it's just data analyst. Yeah, um, I could put a thousand other things but I don't um, because that's my personal preference. So if I were if I were like giving you legitimate, this is what you should do, I would just shorten that to maybe like 15 words or so. Um, that would probably be my personal. And a lot of people do what you, you can see on, on John's screen. Um, he has his like with some breaking. So it's just like some quick heavy hitters. Um, a lot of times, and I, somewhat prefer this is if somebody says data analyst and then it's like a bar and then they say sql or like their top like couple skills uh, and then like open a work or something like that um to me i like the look of that i think it looks pretty good so i like john's right here this is kind of more i guess my style uh, but again everybody has a different style so take that so this okay this is an interesting kind of um conduit for conversation alex i think you and i are, are on linkedin to kind of connect directly to consumers to where Hunter's looking for um, hiring managers. I'm, right. I'm wondering, would you still take that same approach though? To... I would. Okay. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm on a hiring team and when I, when I do interviews and I look people up on LinkedIn, I, I see all these candidates and that's typically, I'm like, I'm like, Hey, that looks pretty good. That's short. It's concise. Um, and that's, again, mine is, Mine is Yours not is very optimized. Simple. Yeah, I just have data analysts. Um, mine is not optimized for like job searching. If I was job searching, I might change it up a little bit. Like mm -hmm. I would probably put like a few of my skills after it. Um, I think I legitimately would do that if I was in a job search. But you're you're right. It it does make a, a slight difference. But for I think what you know what I'm seeing is instead of like having periods at the end, I would use those bars. Um, put some of your skills and then. Um, like searching for summer internship or something like that. So really quick to the point, I'm like 
that's kind of my style. I'm a super like get to the point. This is what it is. Great. I will. I I will say. I I actually really like the idea of bars. In fact, I've seen it around. I just haven't personally implemented it. Not for any particular right. reason. So hearing you say that, I probably would take out some of the filler stuff in here and then do the bars, like you said. Yeah. Well, yeah. Also, too, yeah. update your bio. You yeah. Already, you already have an internship. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, go. I'm going to do that, gonna say, do that are, right this you're second. Not, He's still you're looking. Not, you're not unhappy with this current intern. Chips well, up, are you? <laughs> <I'm> just... <laughs> All right, so we can keep going down. <clears throat> uh, so highlights, yeah. I mean, I just recently learned what this whole creator mode was, to where you can do like highlights and share your content. Um, that's that's new to me, but I like. I think it's good. So people, if people check you out, that's like the first thing they see. Um, and so, yeah, I mean. Looks like you guys are both in some groups and both there. So that's, I guess the highlights is like kind of your, what you guys have in common. Is that what that is? This is new. I do not know really oh, what. I'm not, uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with highlights either. I'm not sure. If you go back to my profile, is. I'll tell you, I'll show you what I was talking about. Cause it, it, okay. going, if you go down, it's the feature. It's the, it's the creator feature, mode where you can like yeah. your stuff. I thought that's what that was. Um, yeah. Cause if we go down a little bit lower, so. Um, there it is. Yeah. So we've we've actually talked about this in multiple. Um, are you familiar, Alex? What we what we did with season two of the podcast, just at a high level. Uh, yeah, I mean, I watched a lot of it, so I'm sure I do. <laughs> so we combined my Greensboro College class, like we yes. found like someone like you, and right. then we did a lot of these like interactive. Basically, the students like Hunter got to interact with people who are like thought leaders in the field. Right. Um, one of the key things that they said is get your portfolio in your featured section. 100%, so, that's what I would do as well. So yeah, so he's got his Tableau Public pulled Ooh, up. See this. Um, yeah, actually, Hunter, <laughs> do you wanna, um, so okay, so he's got two, two here. This actually um, is what was reviewed and good job, Hunter, you did your homework. Thank you. So, so what, what was missing um, in the last kind of portfolio critique that we did is that he had total sessions and revenue. But then um, this was when Danny Lauer from Amazon was critiquing his work. We were saying, why, why don't you have a ratio between the two? So yeah. like re revenue per session. And then um, he can come in and drill down on, let's say, is it interactive? Yeah. I don't know why the internet's dragging so much. I also um, had a pie chart there, and I have heard oh, to the man. ends of the earth. I, I know I'm terribly sorry. Please forgive me, but <laughs> I, I've learned I, at this point. I've learned my lesson that pie is for eating, and I'm not going to worry about that anymore. Yeah, okay, anyway. I have some, I have thoughts on this dashboard, but Alex, I'll let you. What are you, what are your thoughts? Super high level. I mean, I think it looks really clean, really neat. Um, I don't know this data at all, so I can't speak to its validity or the actual like calculations on the back end. But it looks good. It's a good looking uh, dashboard. I don't really have any complaints. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. All right. So he's got you got the dual access line chart like that. Um, this this is weird to me though. I still need to I still need to go back and change that. So it, it almost makes it seem like um, by the coloring on that, that there's like different I, levels to yeah. it, which is not the case. <laughs> I still need to, I still need to go back and tweak that a little bit. And I, I actually meant to, but I, I, I just, it went over my head. So now that you mentioned that it does look like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, so yeah. So two things, I would say the color theories kind of like you're, you're Right, like right now it's looking like direct is the weakest, then it goes organic search, then page search. But really these are just different categories, like these right. are different classifications. And um, Alex, what do you think? I have thoughts on this this um, bar chart. On, uh, what are your thoughts? Because I mean, <laughs> I, I don't, okay. I mean, I personally think that the colors could change you can you can do this in like five six different main uh, like ways that like everybody else does it and it'll show you the same thing i really don't have a huge problem with it i do think that there are other ways that could probably easier show the data um i mean this is almost goes back to the pie chart thing of 
you know, there's no reference, right? You don't, it's hard to compare yeah. when they're like next to each so, other. So, okay, ignore that you, okay. We can see paid search is 3,282. Tell me what social is, Hunter. Is um, it more or less than that? It's not on there. I don't understand why, but. A referral. Oh, social, interesting. No, so so that's the, that's the same issue I've been, I actually did try to figure that out. And I don't know if it's a data quality issue or if it's, if I did some kind of miscalculation somewhere, but social doesn't show up even when I um, switch states or, or I, I tried to go in and see what the categorization was there and it's showing up on, I think it's showing up on the data, but it's just not for whatever reason appearing there. Um, right. Well, there could just be like a weird exclude or something. I think, I think that it might be something like that. Um, but okay. It's from like a data visualization, like I guess theory perspective, um, what you want with a bar chart is you want to have a unified axis because like right now we, this is just a, a box that's next to this box. If it were unified, we could very quickly see that, okay, this one is slightly bigger than this one and it's way less than this one. Right. So from like a data visualization standpoint, I would use, um, like this is a stack bar chart. I would just use like a, a standard having one, like two axes, like whatever, you know, the category or the channel grouping and then the value. Okay. It's the same reason why people don't like pie charts basically. <laughs> right. Okay. I see. So it's, it's like you, you deleted a pie chart and then it's like you got halfway there. Like it is a bar chart. <laughs> it's a but vertical it's pie chart. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> But okay, this is actually one that I um, I wanted Hunter. I wanted you to present, which sure. um, Alex. I don't know if you have you have a, ever have you ever hired someone specifically. I mean, I'm not a hiring manager, but my I help. I'm on the hiring team. Okay, so I help make recommendations. I do the technical portion of our interviews. Um, that's my role in the interview process. Okay, Hunter. All right, so pitch, pitch this to Alex. <laughs> um, let me pull this up on my screen real quick. Um, so this is some survey data that we, that we received in our uh, projects class over at High Point University, and um, actually, they it's been it has been worked on in the past, but we did some tweaks to it. So um, we added. So we had we started out here with um, it's like uh, hardware, and then. Um, how it's like rated in different categories. And so we had uh, the grouping by age up here. This is all interactive. So you can, um, uh-oh, for some reason it's not. All right, so you have to take my word for it. Um, <laughs> when you click the different check marks, it'll show you the it, the uh, different, um, like go to 20 to 29, for example. It'll yeah. bring up the different uh, ratings for that age group, and then sure. uh, course it will correspond to like the count of individuals. So we had six respondents there, and no one rated a five on hardware. And then the same goes for the product number, which um, I believe we had it in class so that um, the actual product would show up, not just the number. But um, it doesn't seem to be appearing here. So wait. Um, T Hunter, tell me what to do. So you want me to pull up the product? Just yeah, the product number, and then like, uh, like by a by, let's say thirty to thirty nine, and then males or something like that. Okay. Well, I think I know it's going to happen, but I kind of want to. We, we can just. Or, or I, well, we can talk about it because I have an okay. idea what's going to happen too. Okay. Um, and you, then you said male. Yeah. Sure. Male. Interesting. So. I don't know if it's still loading or if there's no data, but I would assume that that's too specific. So we probably need to add a few more age age groupings. I would imagine. Right. So what would your recommendation be to the in client if we if you were presenting this to them? I would say do not market product one eight four three two to um or I would say that well I would say that product one eight four three two is currently not popular in males age thirty to thirty nine, and I would ask them exactly. Uh, what what direction they'd want to go there? If they'd want to, if the, if that's part of their target market, then we need to figure out why they're not responding to the survey data, and if that's indicative of of uh, 
of quality issues with the product or something like that, or if we need to um, increase marketing or something like that, that would be something that you would discuss with the client, I suppose. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I would basically say we need to, we need to collect more survey data. Yeah. Well, that's, that sounds really, that sounds really simple, but I, I mean, it is difficult to, I, that being said, it is difficult to collect survey data in general because a lot of people don't like to spend their time filling out surveys um, for whatever reason. But uh, I actually, we actually talked about that briefly in class. Mm -hmm. Even something as simple as a $50 like Visa gift card giveaway will get people to fill out any number of surveys because, hey, people like free money. And so at the end of the day, you have to value what the survey data is worth versus how, uh, how much you want to like invest into it, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Alex, have you worked much with survey data? No, I think the last time I worked with any survey data was back when I was still in the therapy field uh, in college. Oh, interesting. That's, is there a, a, is there a specific like. reason for that? Like, do you just got, think that survey data is like less valuable or? I think it. I think it can be useful in specific situations, but like you were just talking about, there are so many reasons why your survey data, data can be off or wrong or you know, are you marketing to the wrong people? Are people just not taking it because you're um, of how you're um, showing it or displaying it? Uh, do these people just not like the product? Like there's so many things that could be wrong with what you're doing um, or why people are responding or who's seeing it, who's not seeing it. Um, so it's just really, sometimes it can be tough to interpret. Right, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, again, I just don't work with that data. I just, I remember when I did that back in college for a completely different reason uh, I mean, it was, we, we sat at like bus stops and would ask people like with, <laughs> with notepads, these questions and there, you know, there are certain people who would respond, certain people wouldn't. So we didn't have like a whole demographic of who was interested in that topic. It was, right. I don't know, I, just, I, again, I don't work with that data. I'm just, that's, that's right. What I think. Well, yeah, it sounds like the way the, the, the collection process was designed was a little, uh, which, I mean, I guess like as a student. It's, that's kind of okay. I mean, they're probably not right. like basing pharmaceutical decisions on right. the bus stop information. <laughs> exactly. It was, and we, we really catered to the people who rode the bus. I mean, right. we, our, our, we didn't have any data for people who drove cars. I mean, it was ridiculous. <laughs> but Hunter, to give you a better example of a data collection process that I think is really good is on the Silvertone learning platform. At the end of each chapter, we ask demographic questions like, um, what's your gender? What's your age? Um, and then we ask, what do you rate the quality of the, the lectures? And what's cool is that we're then going to have the, the learners in the survey case study course study that data. Right. So this, this data that you're actually, for everyone watching, the data that you're seeing on the screen right now is very similar to something that you could create in one of the uh, learning platforms for Silvertone Analytics. Um, so this is something that when I finished it, I actually felt like I learned quite a bit. And so um, that's not just me saying that because I'm an intern <laughs> at Silvertone Analytics. I, 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 I genuinely think it was really helpful. And so I would go check it out if you get the chance. Cool. Um, all right. Well, so Hunter, I kind of wanted you to like break down and explain it to him at a high level. But you went... So I guess my, my criticism of like how you explained it, and this is something I see happen all the time. And Alex, I don't know, is this something you see frequently? People go directly into the detail. Mm -hmm. um, like Hunter, at a high level, what what is this visualization telling us? It's telling us that we have, um, you would have to give me a second to think about the answer to that. Um, Albert, you wanna bail him out? <laughs> have you seen this before, Albert? I have not, no. Okay. Um, all right. Well, as a professor, I'm going to chime in. So, Alex, at a high level, what this is telling us is how do specific demographics feel about a medical device? Okay. So we can drill down and say, all right, for example, we can – what do females between the age of 29 and, or 20 and 29 feel about this product? And then we can say, oh, they really like the hardware, they don't like the software, which right. um, Hunter, I don't know. So 
in Hunter's defense, we, this lecture was like two or three months ago. <laughs> Do you remember what, why that kind of in, insight about the data is important or valuable? Um, I, well, I would say it's valuable because it, it I mean, it's all, it's all dependent on who you should market to at the end of the day. Because if you have people who are, people who are generally interested in responding to survey da data are people who feel like strongly about it one way or the other. And so I think that if you get people responding from a certain demographic, for example, females, um, more often than males, then maybe that's something that you should consider uh, kind of holst like bolstering up and saying, that, hey, maybe we should examine why there's more females responding. Is that, are those, is that the main people who are purchasing our product? Um, sure. I would say that, that, would make, that would make sense to me. Would you agree? <sighs> Yeah. So I think there are two, there are two types of insights you can get out of, I call this psychographic data. So it's marketing decisions. So, all right, we need to target females between this age bracket or design decisions. Like, okay, we're trying to target these, these females, but they don't like the software component. So we need to go back and maybe let's do another survey to figure out, well, how can we make this better? So those are really kind of the two splits from psychographic data. Right. Cool. But all right, so let's head back to, oh no, where's my mouse? Full screen mode. And Alex, I wanted to kind of talk to you about what makes online content or, I, I know that you've taken a bunch of different courses. What makes something really high quality in your, in your perspective or your mind? So like what, what makes a really good course? Right. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I have taken too many. I mean, honestly, probably like in the hundreds of courses uh, over the past couple of years, just because I, I went through like a streak of just being like super obsessed. Um, and I have taken some bad courses. I think a lot of the courses I've taken are, are good. I think the ones that make that are really good um, are ones that not only teach you the skills, and this is just one of the points I'm going to make, but not only teaches you the skills, but then gives you an opportunity to then build something. I think where I've seen ones that I didn't like is where they briefly explain the concept and they didn't let you use it somehow, right? So they're just like, you know, here's how you do this in Excel. I'm like, oh, well, that's great. You know, how would I actually use this in my job? Like, how do I use this as a data analyst? Um, and I didn't, when I was first starting out, I was just like, oh, that's really cool. But then as I got more advanced, I'm like, I know how to do that, but how do I actually implement it? Like, how do I use the right. skill? Um, and so the really good, I mean, I, there are a few courses that I'm like, these are just amazing. The ones that I think are like super top tier, like amazing, like I recommend them on my channel and to people who I just chat with um, on LinkedIn, the ones in that, in that category are genuinely the ones that not only teach it super well in a really clear, effective way, and then give you opportunities to do it, but then at the end have some type of larger project to kind of tie all those concepts and, and um, skills that you're learning together. Interesting. Because I, I think that's something that's really tough to scale. Because something that when, like- When you say scale, what do you mean by scale? Okay, so for example, I, I guess let me kind of break down what's been going on kind of in my world, kind of behind the scenes to kind of like I guess, pull back the curtain. Mm -hmm. So um, I got, I became a professor a year ago and I taught this, this class called case studies and business analytics at Greensboro college. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we built out a portfolio and then they worked with my email data to actually, to create a, an email campaign. And they studied my past emails to see how they can improve. So they like, they, they cho chose like time of day. Um, then we kind of, I got to the chance to essentially teach the same class only with a slightly different project at High Point University. So it's called mm -hmm. the special projects class. And this is actually where I picked up Hunter. So Hunter was, you were, well, you were a sophomore, right? You're yeah, now, I was a you're sophomore now joining. In class. Yeah. So um, one of the disadvantages I have as a professor is that I teach the students for a year and then they go off and they graduate. So luckily I have, have Hunter here. So then we did the same thing where we're doing that project that's driving an actual business decision what I'm trying to do with the Silvertone learning platform is figuring out how to facilitate that on a larger scale. Cause like, at, like the, the Udemy course that I created on power BI has got 35,000 people. How can I make it feel like you guys are working on a project to get, I don't know if that's even solvable. 
Yeah, I mean, to the, I get what you're saying now by scale. At the same time, you know, the people who are typically, at least for the beginner courses, like teaching you the skills, and then, you know, you're not going to have like a crazy, a, you want you're not going to have anything crazy advanced, right? Mm -hmm. But you want to go over the skills. Now, if you're trying to create a more advanced course, um, it does get a little bit trickier because the people you're catering to are could be professionals or people who already are somewhat advanced. That's when it becomes, I think, a, a bigger problem because I, I think creating smaller projects, at least when you're a professional, you're creating these small projects. And it shouldn't be crazy hard. Um, but if you do want to get much more in the weeds of like a lot more, getting a lot more technical and, and, and understanding that business acumen piece of it and the domain knowledge, that's when it gets like quite a bit more complicated to actually create and mm -hmm. continue to do that. So I can see your I can see your problem if that's kind of what you're trying to cater to. Right. Well, also too, kind of the other problem is that so we're building out the like this is this this is essentially like prototype two of what we just what I, I just built out as a, mo a module for the learning platform, and it's actually like. For example, the sample size was too small, and we found found mm -hmm. that out in Hunter's class. So I upped the sample size so that it's actually you can get meaningful insight. But actually, I mean, I, this is kind of like a tangent. I increased it, but not so that the problem's completely gone. So if you you can get valuable information drilling down on product number or age, but if you do product number and age, then you get to where where it's not significantly, I guess, large enough of a sample size. Sure. Um, but what we're running into now is the challenge is that, okay, say 50 people take this course. They all have the exact same <laughs> portfolio. Right. I think Al though, I think you may have figured out how to solve that problem. <laughs> On getting different people to take the course? Well, no, of having a unique dashboard or por portfolio piece. Oh. With, um, posting on LinkedIn and having us give like, have them come in, customize it, then post it on LinkedIn. And then we come in and, and kind of like give feedback because you're doing that with the Google challenge now. Yes. And I think we can apply that same concept to the, the visualizations. Oh, neat. Yeah. I hadn't, hadn't thought of that. I, I was just looking for, uh, for something to generate content and get people to write something and, uh, and practice. So. Yeah, yeah, you're right. That uh, if you if you can get them to to start putting their their dashboards and their projects out there, it'll work too. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, Alex, I don't, did you see that post? You probably didn't because you've got so many things coming your way. Sorry about that. Uh, I don't remember that post. But what I will say about how you can create, I don't know, maybe unique dashboards, or you can at least get unique data per user, is to have some type of if you're using like LinkedIn, you know have a script or something that pulls the data. So everybody who pulls the data is going to not pull the same data. So it, you know, if each person is running it in like a Python IDE or they're pulling it from an API for, from LinkedIn, no one person will have the same data. So that might be a workaround. They may have the same types of visualizations, but the data itself will all be different. I have no idea what any of that means. So I, I have oh. like a very basic level of understanding of Python. Yeah. I'm fascinated though. So tell me, so tell me more about this idea. I'm kind of so like curious. On a now. super simple scale, you know, you I use Python for my web scraping and mm -hmm. I either use an API or then I or I just go directly to the website and pull it using like be beautiful soup or selenium or something like that. Um, the the idea is is that if I'm running it on my computer and I'm hitting off LinkedIn's API, and it's going to be different for every single person who runs that script. So if I run it, and then I pass that exact same script over to Al, and then he runs it, it's going to be different. Um, especially if you're pulling it using like Beautiful Soup, Beautiful Soup or something like that directly from the website itself. Whenever, whoever runs it, it will 100% be different because no, no two people are looking at the same exact content and information and everything. Um, I've done some, I've done many projects like personal projects like this, where I'm pulling data from Amazon, eBay, um, Twitter, Facebook, and I pull the data in and every time I run it, every time I refresh it, it's different data. Um, because I, depending on tweets or depending on pr product pricing on Amazon that updates all the time, that could be 
Um, that could be a potential workaround if you were able to incorporate that into a project, you know, provide some type of groundwork for here's how you create this script to, to do this. Here's what you should be getting back. Um, and that, that's kind of what I do typically when I do any web scraping. I, I think it, it could solve that problem potentially. Well, I, cause I know you're, you're starting to do series now of portfolio projects. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to kind of pick your brain about like what, what makes a project worthwhile of adding to, I guess you're probably on GitHub. So, so I think that we're, we're in the Tableau space, which I think is like right. a good first, because I mean, you Absolutely. can learn Tableau in a couple of days. So Absolutely. just getting to that to where like, I, I'm kind of curious, how long did it take you to learn how to web scrape in Python? Uh, it took me months to learn Python. <laughs> but, okay. then, but, but then once, once you got that it, working knowledge, it's... Right. I think, I think genuinely to get good at it, it probably took me a good month. But I mean, I was able to follow like some tutorials that I found online and get actual data. And I was like, this is insane. I was like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Um, but to actually create something that was like, you know, I've done stuff where I, I used to be really into watches while I still am, but I, it took me a good month or a couple of weeks to create a script that would check the prices every hour. And then once it hit a certain point, it sent me an email saying, Hey, buy this watch because it reached the price that you're looking for. It, I mean, it took me a long time to put all those pieces together. So, you know, a couple of weeks to a month um, to, to figure all that out and make it look good and usable. Okay. So, sorry, we, we went on this total tangent. So <laughs> what makes a yeah, portfolio good in your eyes? Um, you know, I think it's, it depends on a, you know, I think the main domain changes things in my portfolio. I have healthcare things. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I don't see myself getting out of healthcare anytime soon. I really like healthcare. I'm good at it. Um, that's my specialty. And I think that's why I get paid well. I think that whatever domain you're in, you know, know that demographic if you're trying to cater to that. Something that I always look for is the basics, right? Are they doing the basics right? So if they have a Python um, portfolio project or they have a Tableau visualization, like are they doing the basics right? That tells me that they have probably done it re repeatedly. Um, and, and so if I'm seeing a project and they're, and they're using weird stuff and I'm like, why are they doing it this way and not like the main way, you know, that's something that can be either something I bring up in their interview. Um, and I'm like, hey, you know, I checked out your portfolio project. Uh, can you walk me through why you did this? That usually catches people off guard, right? Because they're like, oh gosh, this guy knows that I have a portfolio <laughs> and he's asking me about it like I'm on the spot. Because anybody can copy and paste and create a portfolio, but if, unless you know it, um, you know, you don't, you don't really know it. And so it's hard to fake. So I think to me, when I'm looking at people's portfolios and I've looked at a lot, I like seeing the staples, but I also like to go a little bit beyond that. So the ones that I create on, on that I've created on my channel, I mean, the SQL ones, I did a lot of the staples that I walked through in the courses that I make, but then I go a little, just a little bit farther beyond that. Um, and for the Tableau, because I'd done one Tableau one, I just kept it super simple. I was like, here's how you create a dashboard. Here's how you take the data, you create the visualizations, you put it into a dashboard, here you go. You know, going a little bit further beyond that and actually trying to think of like a use case um, is probably the next best thing to do. You know, you want to not only create something that's visually appealing, but it actually be helpful and impactful in some way whether that's you're doing like Yu-Gi-Oh card trading numbers or you're scraping data and doing sentiment analysis or whatever you're doing, you know, have a, be the other, be a purpose to it, right. For some demographic, uh, don't just kind of randomly do something. So, you know, some, some vision, some, some sense of like purpose for what they're doing is, is another good thing to have in, in a portfolio project. Not for nothing, but I have a friend of mine who actually um, he does he does a little bit of Python web scraping, but he does it for Pokemon cards. So you were talking yeah. about Yu Gi Oh. He does yeah. it for Pokemon cards. He's made five thousand dollars off of it. So yeah. maybe it's the time to get into Python web scraping for Pokemon. I don't know. It is. I, I I'm I have dabbled in creating um, like you know I do. I do some investing and stuff like that in, you know, taking in that data and using that to like invest with. Right. 
uh, you know, there's a lot of applications for using live data online, whether you're scraping like, like um, Pokemon cards to see when prices go up or down and when you should sell or when you should buy, or like trading stocks or something like that. I mean, there's so, there's a lot of use cases for, for data. I mean, it, it, it really does drive everything. Yeah. Well, and I think that having it solve an actual problem means that it's, it's somewhat of a disciplined thought process. Yeah. Um, Cause in the, in an interview setting, what would you say is the purpose of a portfolio? I guess there's multiple purposes, isn't there? Like if I was the inter if I was interviewing or if I was being interviewed. So, okay. No, as, as you, someone is coming and showing you as a person hiring or the team that's hiring. Right. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of people who have brought it up and I always like when it comes up naturally in conversation, you know, I'm ask I, I ask them, Again, I'm the technical person, so I, I ask the technical questions. I say, hey, how well do you know SQL? That's like the first question. And they'll be like, I've used it. I'm like, that tells me nothing. But what is a really good answer is, especially if they don't have any experience or maybe they do have some experience, a really good answer is um, I view SQL in a lot of different ways. I've used it for this and this data exploration, data cleaning. And here's a project, I, I recently did a project um, and you can, if you want to check it out, you can see it in my portfolio that I have. Um, it's on my resume. And in that project, I walk through these steps. I'm using some of these things. And so, you know, that's kind of how I view SQL. That to me is extremely compelling. I, it, it makes me have a little bit more confidence that they know what they're talking about. It gives some credibility that they built something, that they've done something with that knowledge rather than just take courses and put it on their resume. Um, so to me, that that the, 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 por the project should be brought up in an interview. Um, and I even do that. I've done that even since I've had experience. Um, when I got the job that I'm in now, I remember that I had already had almost a year and a half, two years of experience. And I was like, you know, I have that experience, but I also have these really cool projects. And so, yes, I've done those, but here's some cool projects that I'm working on the side that I'm like really passionate about that I thought were like, you know, pretty sweet. Um, and so I, I kind of just mix that into the conversation when, when talking about like, why they should hire me and my technical abilities. Yeah. I essentially see it as a conversational tool. Yeah. So oh, like, sure. yeah, like you, you can, it's, it's a point, it's like an emotional bid in a sense, like, Oh, he, you know, uh, here's a visualization on sports. Oh, you're, you're, you like football too. That's, that's a point where you can connect. Right. And it's like, it works on multiple levels. Cause it's like, you're connecting on that human level of, Hey, we have things in common. And if I had to work with this person nine to five, it might not be so terrible. But then on the like deeper level, it's like, but they also know the technical side of things. So it's kind right. of like that. It's kind of like a branding stack. Yeah. I mean, I'm always looking to mix. If, if I'm being interviewed, I always try to mix in some way to get more personal. <laughs> like, you know, I'll mention that I have a dog or something. I don't know, completely random or, or <laughs> um, that I like a football team, like you said, and try to mix that in. So yeah, it's a good, it definitely can be a good, kind of passion piece because um, I've done projects. I mean, I've done way too many projects to count, but ones that I've had on my, uh, I always have had something related to like sports, even though I'm not in sports at all in my job um, and relating to like watches or pricing or, or something like that. There's something that I'm passionate about. I like talking about. And if they also like talking about that, I mean, I could talk for hours about those things. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I there are two different types of projects. There's passion projects and there's domain projects. I mean, I don't think I'm necessarily like, man, healthcare, that is like what I live for. Um, but I enjoy it. I like it. So I can make projects on it. But then when there's like my passion that I'm like, I really like. So, you know, I think there's a healthy balance in there. I wouldn't do only passion projects. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's also too like uh, there, there's there's something to be said for like if you own, if you turn what you're passionate about into how you make money. I mean, that's risky kind of because <laughs> then it, you're it doing is, yeah. it because even if you don't want to do it, it's not, it's not like you can take a break. You're then tied to that right day in and day out. Yeah. Well, I absolutely agree. I mean, people have asked me if I was like going to quit my job and become a YouTuber full time. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was like, this is one of those scenarios where if I were to go full time, I'd probably end up hating it. And then I would regret my decision immensely. Um, and so, you know, I, I really like doing it. I could, I, you know, I could do some projects on like the YouTube data and stuff, but man, I don't want to like go crazy with it. 
So it's, it's kind of that like, there's a, there's a fine line in there somewhere. Yeah. Well, also too, something that um, I've noticed you've been doing is you're starting to do individual coaching now, right? I've been or doing that coaching? for over almost a year now. Really? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I've, I've been doing that for over a year. I mean, I probably worked with over the course of it, like 30 different people. Um, and I have, uh, I have a long wait list already. Um, and I, I just have always had a wait list and every person I've worked with has come from a different background or different, um, even country. I mean, I've worked with people from all around the world and everybody is just in a different place in their lives and their careers and their skill levels and, and, and whatnot. And so I re I'm just a super, per I become, I will say I've become a lot more like personable, whereas I used to not want to hang out with people that much. Um, I'm much more personal. And so that to me is more like, I just really like, you know, interacting with people and helping people on that level. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I feel like I can really connect with you there. That's how I feel about the teaching. Yeah. Like, like there, there's something that's really kind of special about like seeing Hunter, like embrace his nerdiness and his, for his love for data. <laughs> <laughs> so are, are there um, any like common things that you're seeing or is it pretty much unique case to case by each person that you're coaching? No, I see a lot of trends. Um, and now that I've gotten a lot more and a lot of people who I've worked with have gotten jobs um, and some haven't, I do see trends. I think that the people who end up getting jobs and I'm telling you, some of these people who I've worked with who have gotten jobs, I'm like, they started from bare bones. Like what skills do I need to learn? That's like, I've worked with some people like that. And then three, four months later, they, they've got it like an internship or an entry level job. And so I mean, I've seen it from all over, but the people who are getting the jobs are the people who are like really dedicated to it, who are spending a lot of time investing their time um, and are confident that they're this is what they're supposed to do. Um, conversely, there are people who I've worked with who haven't gotten jobs who are kind of, you know, if you're watching this and you've worked with me and you didn't get a job, this not directed at you, I promise. But, you know, some people who I've worked with are a little bit more lackadaisical about it. Mm -hmm. Right. They're like, you know, oh, I know I said I was going to do that project, you know, two months ago. I still haven't gotten to it. Or, you know, I know I said I was going to start reaching out to recruiters, but, you know, that was a month ago. And I haven't started doing it. I, you know, my what I'm trying to do is just to motivate them, give them very concrete guidance. Here's what I would do if I were you. And here's like the things that I would try to um, strive for within like this time frame. And if they don't meet those, you know, that's not on me. I, I, I really like. It's it's one hundred percent on them. I'm just like more of a guide to, than anything. Yeah. Well, I think also too something. So um, we helped my my childhood friend actually Molly Welsh get her first data science job. Oh, that's cool. And um, it it was too it she she was kind of it's interesting because she went through that lackadaisical phase of like oh yeah that might be I'm going to apply to these like so she was in the environmental science space. And right. she was like applying to environmental science and then maybe like one or one or two or like looking at data science jobs. Right. And then she finally realized like it kind of sunk in that like, oh, the earning threshold, I'm like pretty much tapped out. Like I might get mm -hmm. that like what, two to four percent inflation or cost of living adjustment. But right. I'm done here to where um, I mean, she got a 40 percent raise to entry level data science mm -hmm. job. Um, but yeah, it was two months of her. You, well, really what we did is we brought her on the podcast and it's like she had to do the projects mm -hmm. <laughs> or she was going to let me down and all of the fans down. So I think there's something about the accountability piece right. of, of especially if they're if they're paying you money to coach them. Right. They have some kind of skin in the game because I think right. those people who are that's interesting that they were paying you and they were kind of lackadaisical. I mean, is that was that a very small portion of them yeah maybe 10 to 20 percent okay. um so there, there was a handful like i would say three to six people ish um, and i've worked with 30 i would say that's about right um most people took it pretty seriously um and what you said was 100 percent accurate a lot of people just want accountability they want someone right. who they're going to be like hey i'm seeing and there are people who I've been working with for like nine months and they got a job like four months ago and they're like, I just like being accountable and, and like being able to talk about my job and then getting some feedback. Like there's one person I'm working with who I've, I've been working with them for about nine months and he got a job five, four, five months ago. And, he, and I was like, hey, 
congratulations. Like, you know, I'll, you know, I, I will, I'll open that, up that spot. And he was like, Hey, if it's possible, can I just keep meeting with you? He's like, cause I, I'm going to have questions about like when I first start and my boss and my coworkers and how do I interact with them and all these things. I was like, that sounds fantastic. Um, and so a lot of people really do, they want that accountability because when they're on, when they're by themselves, they're a little bit lazier about it. Um, mm -hmm. and so that is absolutely feedback that I've gotten is that I, that it's a lot of accountability piece of it. Well, okay. And I, I'm going to bring this back full circle. <laughs> okay. So, um, what's, what's like, what blows my mind is that over the past like year and a half to two years, I've had a half a million students take my Udemy or LinkedIn courses, but there's something about it that is lost. So we were mentioning scale and like how, how to scale that essentially, like how do you, how do you scale that accountability? I feel like a, lo a lot of people are essentially just consuming. It's like, it's this edutainment space. Mm -hmm. It's like they're kind of learning, but really it's just like they're consuming and they're not, I don't know, right. putting on like that critical thinking hat. Right. Um, Cause yeah, it's, it's Hunter. We, we've talked about this. So Hunter is now moderating the Q and a section for my power BI course. Hunter, oh, cool. T tell us a little bit about what's going on with that. So um, there's the Q&A section is interesting in that um, when you post a question on Udemy, um, for all those watching who haven't used Udemy, you can actually – it's a publicly moderated forum. So everybody on there can see everyone else's questions and respond to them if they, if they have an answer. So oftentimes there will be questions that have been already asked in the Q&A forum like – repeatedly over and over again and people will just either post the question anyway and wait to hear an answer or when i give them an answer it they they and i or so I'll, let me give a specific example i had a person who had um had an issue that i was unable to re replicate i couldn't come up with the same problem they were having and so i had i had asked for a uh just like a, a quick screenshot saying hey how can i help you I'm unable to replicate it. Can you show me what's on your screen? And then they they just didn't respond. So it's like at a certain point, it's like that's that's not on us because I'm, we're doing it right, and you're not willing to put forth the effort that go the extra mile to actually figure out what the issue is. And I think I think that's just that that might be a little bit of an issue with scale is that you have a lot of people who are coming from a, a variety of different places. There's going to be the people who do take it seriously and say, hey, this is a great course that's for a great price. But there's also a lot of people in the complete opposite direction who are just like, this course is is not, it's just not for them for whatever reason. And so I, I, that's that's some of the issues that we've been experiencing. Well, with, also too, yeah, it's like, yeah, I don't know, eight, 90% of people don't get past lecture like three or something like that. It's like um, they're buying and, and see, this is what's interesting about you to me is that it's like, it, it's, it's constantly on sale and then they go on the mega sale and then you just buy like five courses. But I don't know. A lot of people don't, it's like they, they, they get them, but then they don't open them up. I, I don't know. I, I guess that's probably not your problem though. You, you probably don't buy a course unless you're like full fledged going to go into it. Uh, I mean, I bought courses that I returned to. I was like, I really want to learn Scala or, or something like that. And then I was like looking at it, like, I actually don't think I want to learn that. I've returned it. I will say, I would say like 99% of my, the courses that I bought though, I've taken the entire way. Like I don't usually stop halfway or skim. Like I'm, I'm pretty dedicated to like finishing a course once I start it. Well, I, I think that's uh, something else that's interesting about the about the Power BI course is that Power BI and Tableau already have that low barrier to entry. So at a certain point, it's less about the like the difficulty of the course, for example, where it's like you go in the course, it's like yeah, I just can't do this, and you back out. <laughs> it's it's more of like we said, a lack of accountability. I think. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of self work on the people who are taking the course. Um, and not everybody is meant or cut out to do this type of work. It, it, I mean, as much as I try to, you know, tell people and help people get jobs, there is a lot of self work that you have to do, right? There's a lot of time you need to spend investing in yourself. And 
a lot of people either don't have the motivation or the direction of exact in i think the direction piece is also a big one but don't have the motivation to, to do it because they aren't they're unsure they're not 100 percent that they're going to get it and so people who like they're like well what skill do i learn what do i need to know in that skill and they don't have that concrete direction of where they're trying to go um end up getting lost in courses and then never end up making it all the way uh and you know that i i that never was me but i've seen it a thousand times um and so, yeah, I mean, I, I've, I, a lot of what you're saying is definitely ringing true to me. Tell me a little bit more. What do you mean by self-work? Like just self-reflection or like being honest with yourself? More of you got to put in the work to make it happen. Like you okay. have to put in that. No one's going to, no one can force you to learn Python, right? Python is, it's tough. It's tricky. There's some easy parts and there's some super hard parts and really complex. And if you don't put in the time and the effort to actually learn those things and make mistakes and then learn from it and do your research on Stack Overflow and and just Google it, you're never gonna like you're never gonna learn Python as well as you could if you put in that time and effort. Um, and so it, I think it's just there's a lot of you are the only person who's gonna make it happen and be good at what you do. So you need to put in the work um, and. That is hard for a lot of people. Okay. Well, we are coming up right on an hour, and it is 11.30 p.m. here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Al, That's you've been bedtime. quiet, but I appreciate you pushing through. Because <laughs> I know it's way past your bedtime, isn't it? No worries, man. <laughs> well, Alex, Anything with you. Alex involved, I'm there on game day. So, Thank you so much for coming on. Um, what, what's the best place for people to connect with you? Probably your YouTube, right? You're talking to Al? No, Alex. <laughs> yeah. 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 We're all deliriously that's, tired right now. <laughs> no, that's why you got to put the Bert on there, man. Albert, LA. Everybody Albert. <laughs> Alberto. Albert. Yeah. All right. 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 Um, <clears throat> yeah. Check me out on my YouTube channel. I think I got some good content over there. Um, and then LinkedIn. Those are the only two places that I really am. I, well, don't message me on email. I get too many emails. But LinkedIn, I, I, I respond to every single person who messages me on LinkedIn. So, wow. Um, yeah, find me on LinkedIn, follow me, send me a message. I'll be sure to message back. That's awesome. Well, Alex Freyberg, congratulations on 70,000 subscribers. Thank That's incredible. Much. And thank you for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was fun. <laughs>